points out a few things. That is that all of our common carnivores, all the carnivores that we know of, jackals, um, or that we think of, I should say, not all that we know of, but jackals, coyotes, um, dogs, wolves, they can all interbreed. And one of the definitions of a species is that they don't breed with other species. You know, they can only breed within themselves. But that doesn't hold true with carnivores. They can actually breed with each other and produce offspring that are, that are reproductively capable. All right? And so they sort of go outside of that definition. And Coppinger points that out. It's a behavioral distinction rather than Linnaean. Linnaean is the guy who came up with by name, binomial nomenclature. He came up with scientific names, and he sort of just defined the species. But dogs are behavioral species. And one thing that, that Coppinger points out is that they really are a species unto themselves. And let's get that notion out of our mind that these dogs are just tame wolves. Because wolves are a different species than dogs. Susan, am I right or am I right on that? OK, good. I'd like to get the expert to back me up on a point like that. Um, and this whole thing where we start applying pack mentality to dogs, that's taken too far in some circles, especially some circles on National Geographic TV. Company <laughs> 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 also points out that mitochondrial studies, mitochondrial DNA studies are unreliable, and in fact they are, and that he believes in this Natuvian origin for dogs splitting off from wolves about 12,000 years ago. But it's going to get a little bit more complicated than that. And there's that, that region that I'm talking about. And uh, Coppinger also points out that the uh, DNA evidence, or the archaeological evidence, rather, of dogs prior to 12,000 years ago is sparse. He believes that dogs are a product of serious agriculture. When we really settled down to uh, an agricultural community, that's when dogs really came into being. Uh, Michelle Razor, in her, uh, in her PhD thesis, you can find this online if you're really, really interested. I can give you the, the reference for it. Dogs were dogs long before man even considered exploiting them through selective breeding. Her view is, and many others are, that dogs probably did split off from wolves, maybe as far, as, as far back as 100,000 years or so, 130,000 years or so. But that doesn't mean that they were so-called domesticated. That doesn't mean that they were following us around doing tricks and all of that sort of thing. They were filling another niche. Now, you know, wolf varieties, and Ray Coppinger points this out, there is a huge difference, one of the differences between wolves and dogs. When you see one wolf, you've pretty much seen them all, right? I mean, they're just, they're, they're pretty similar. So we have a timber wolf and then something called a red wolf. There's only one real battle. This is a dire wolf, which is now an extinct species of wolf. They all pretty much look the same, except for that wolf who is <laughs> CNN. That's the only one that I know. It's so pretty much a variation in the type. But dogs, you know, this huge variety. I just picked these up. You know, I just picked up these pictures quickly. I could have had many, many more diverse pictures of dogs, many shapes and sizes. So. Why did this come to be? And this is what I really want to spend my time on today, what I've been racing through the last section to get through, is why did dogs evolve? Well, how did they come into to sharing this bond that we have? And there are several theories of domestication. And I've broken them into three groups. But first is the adoption theory. How many of you learned, you know, when I grew up and I would read my little color books about, about dogs coming into being, how many learned this? that? cavemen went out and got wolf puppies and brought them back and tamed them, and that's how dogs came to be. Yeah, sure. I mean, that was sort of the underlying premise. That, you know, that, and it sort of makes sense. You go out and you get some puppies, you tame them, and, uh, and you, you, have, uh, you have a pet. But it takes, it, it, it really makes, it, it, it begs a lot of questions. Let me put it that way. And they are these. One is that wolves, when captured as, as infants, can be easily trained and assimilated within a social society. And that's a pretty big assumption. And I can show you movies, and, and I, I bet you've all seen them, where those wolves grew up, as I said about the raccoons, those wolves were fine for a few months. And then things kind of got out of hand until, man, out the door. We can't take you guys anymore. Um, the other is that, you know, 
did, did Mesolithic humans, that is the Middle Stone Age human beings, actually have the cognitive powers and understanding or the foresight to say, you know what, this is really a good idea. I can see what's down the road if we take these dogs and tame them. Plus, they would need a huge amount of time to do this and a lot of facilities to do it. Uh, what they would need, they need a large population of wolves because if you're going to select for a certain trait, you need a variation from your, pop, from your population in order to say, okay, we're going to take those with this particular trait, in this case, taming. In this case, they're tame. And we're just going to breed the tame ones. So you need a lot of variation. You need a lot of population. You can see in wolves there, aren't, there isn't a huge amount of variation. You need an ability to selectively breed. You know, when wolves get to be a breeding age, which, by the way, is a couple years of age, they probably have their own mind about who they want to breed with. Okay? And so us going around saying, no, it's going to be you and you, and it probably isn't going to go over real big. They need time, lots of it. So there's a lot of problems with that adoption theory, and what really sounds better is a self-domestication theory, and that is that dogs are tame wolves, they, you know, they found a selective advantage in being near human beings. And so over time, they got some benefits from that, or you know, there may have been some mutual benefits, or that people just, in, in essence, regarded them benignly, and that wolves you know, came, to, came to live near us. So self-domestication, and uh, Ray Coppinger puts this out as a, as a possibility. What you have is people starting to settle down into communities, and you gotta have a dump, right? Okay? I mean, if you have a community, you gotta have somewhere to put your trash in the garbage, so the, the trash in the garbage goes out. And then what happens is that you have wolves who say, all right, this is a little bit easier than chasing down the next gazelle, or whatever it is. Um, I think I'll just hang out here for a little while. So when Barney Rubble goes and takes the trash out, you're going to have those wolves that are more furtive and they're going to run away. And they're not going to come back very soon, okay, because they're afraid of people. And then there are going to be those that are going to stay in closer and they aren't going to run as far and they're going to come back sooner and they're going to be the more tame ones and they're going to have a great advantage. They're going to get the lion's share of the food. And so there's going to be a selective advantage for those having enough energy to reproduce, get into the next generation, and that's the way evolution works. And you know, people in this, in the self, uh, in the self-domestication theory, maybe we got some advantages from them, but you know, at least they, we didn't cause them much harm. They didn't cause us much harm. They didn't cause us much harm. Uh, and that takes us into the next idea of how we came together, and that's self-domestication and co-evolution. And here, we came together, dogs and people, for considerable benefits in this <coughs> to both species. And like the evolutionary changes that would not occur had we not gotten together. So what were some of those human benefits? One would be early warning. You got a bunch of dogs hanging out around the periphery of your campsite, and the, uh, the next bad guy comes in, you're going to get some warning about that, right? Especially at nighttime, because dogs are always yowling when something comes in that shouldn't. And also lessons in cooperative hunting. We'll take that a little bit further as we go along. So uh, Michelle Razor, whose, whose PhD uh, thesis I mentioned before, her sort of uh, algorithm for how this occurred is that humans encroach, encroach upon the wolf habitat and that influences the neurochemistry and the rate of genetic variation. You have more calming type of hormones going through these creatures because they're the ones who are going to stay around as the trash gets taken out. And then it also leads to some morphological changes, the retention of neonatal characteristics, and we'll talk about that. Smaller, less aggressive animals, and so true domestication occurring when settlements occur about 12,000 years ago. Paul Tacon and Colin Pardo are two Australian researchers, and they take this whole thing another step further. And I think in a very interesting way, Ray Coppinger would say, you know, yes, anything you want, there's no evidence for it. And that's, to me, fine. Uh, and, and he's right, there is no evidence for it, but it's still fun guessing. Uh, however, Pardo and Tacon would claim that there is more evidence for it. First of all, they believe in this 130,000 year old origin of dogs from wolves. And they, they cite that mitochondrial DNA evidence. 
they say that humans watched dogs and we got